A portion of this video is brought to you by Surfshark. When it comes to grid scale energy storage, redox flow batteries are one of the big competitors for lithium ion batteries. In preliminary tests, redox flow batteries can be manufactured with longer lasting lives, be made more scalable, and are easier to recycle than other battery technologies. Yet after investing millions of US tax dollars into a cutting edge redox flow battery formula, the American government basically gave it away to China, who's currently the lead producer of redox flow batteries. So how did this invention flow out of the US, and why should we even care about redox flow batteries? Let's face it, installing tons of solar panels and wind turbines is not going to be enough to decarbonize our energy system. We desperately need cost-effective batteries to store spare renewables and reuse them when we need them most. According to the US Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the American energy storage capacity should experience an over five-fold increase by 2050 to meet the country's zero-carbon electricity demand. And funny enough, the very same department gave away a very promising storage technology to China a few years ago. Before trying to make sense of this crazy story, let's understand what redox flow batteries, or RFBs, are all about. The key components of the system are two electrolytes, which are liquid solutions containing active elements in a different oxidation state. And unlike lithium-ion batteries, where a single electrolyte floats inside the cell, in a flow battery, two solutions storing the chemical energy sit inside external tanks. And during the battery operation, these electrolytes flow from the tanks towards a central chamber. In its simplest design, the chamber, also known as a stack, features two half cells separated by an ion-selective membrane. So what about the redox bit? Well, this term refers to the reduction and oxidation reactions that the chemicals dissolved in the solutions are subjected to. To be more specific, upon discharging, the ions in one of the tank cell pairs, called analyte, increase their oxidation state. In other words, they lose electrons. Traveling through the external circuit, these electrons bypass the membrane and reach the other side, which is the catholite. And here the ions take up electrons and reduce their oxidation state. To recharge the battery, you just connect it to the grid and use the incoming electrons flow to reverse the redox process. Depending on the active elements in the electrolyte, there are various types of RFB. However, the all vanadium configuration is currently the most widely commercialized. So why vanadium? It's not because it's the most beautiful element in the world, but this metal has multiple oxidation states, which comes in handy when you rely on the redox mechanism. By harnessing vanadium's chemical versatility, you don't need to introduce any other element into the electrolytes except sulfur. Basically, you use a mild sulfuric acid solution to dissolve vanadium sulfates. After doing that, you're left with two vanadium redox couples in the catholite. This removes the cross-contamination risk implied by their designs, which is why vanadium redox flow batteries can last up to four times longer than other comparable devices. Lithium-ion batteries are great for short-term applications, but RFB are more apt for long-duration storage. RFB's supply chain is also greener as their components are more recyclable, which reduces the amount of waste ending up in landfills. It's for this reason that many believe that it will play a key role in the future of energy storage. Yet this technology is nothing new. NASA began developing them during the energy crisis in the 1970s, and after three decades of lackluster results, 2006 was a breakthrough year. As several patents expired, it opened up private companies to get their creative electrolytes flowing. Also in the same year, US researchers started working on an improved recipe for redox flow batteries. After six years of efforts funded by over 15 million American taxpayer dollars, scientists came up with a vanadium-based electrolyte formulation twice as powerful as similar mixtures. On top of that, their battery could perform well for up to 30 years without showing any sign of degradation. So what was the trick? Well, they simply swapped the conventional sulfuric acid solution with a blend of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. When using this modified mixture, they increased the solubility of vanadium, which boosted the electrolyte energy density. The benefits didn't stop there, though. The acidic mix could work on a wider range of temperatures compared to the pure sulfuric acid solution, which reduces heating and cooling costs. Supercharged by these electrifying findings, in 2012, the research group leader Gary Yang applied to the Department of Energy for a license to commercialize the batteries outside of the lab. And once he signed the agreement, he launched the startup Uni Energy Technologies. However, because of the long time needed for his battery to generate returns, Yang claimed to be struggling to persuade US investors to sponsor his creation. Using that as an excuse, he turned to the Chinese company Dalian Ranka Power, and in 2017 granted them official sub-license to manufacture some of the batteries in China. And this is where things went wrong. But before I get into that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark. I always recommend using a VPN when using public Wi-Fi, but VPNs can be very useful even when you're at home. A lot of online services can use some pretty sophisticated commercial tracking and machine learning to apply very targeted advertising, and a VPN can protect you from some of that. Surfshark's clean web does a great job blocking ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet even at home. 
and you can even make it look like your IP address is coming from a completely different country. This can come in handy if you want to stream a video that's only available from a specific location. And one of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all of your devices, whether that's iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. Use my code to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Links in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to where things went wrong with this new battery chemistry. Now, although the license entailed making most of the batteries in the US, battery production gradually switched from America to China. And according to people I spoke to that worked at Uni Energy at the time, the key components of the battery were never built in the US at all, but instead built in China and shipped to the US for assembly and testing. And to make matters worse, Uni Energy continued its shifting of this US funded tech to outside the US by transferring its license to the European company Vanitas Power in 2021. Now, according to Yang, the underlying issue is that unlike China, the US doesn't have the supply chain to meet production demand. Yet this infrastructural gap wasn't created overnight. Over the last 10 years, China issued series of national policies that flowed a lot of cash out of the government coffers to scale up vanadium redox flow batteries. So it shouldn't be a surprise that after six years of development and $300 million of investment, last May, a 100 megawatt, 400 megawatt hour demonstration facility was connected to the Dalian grid. And guess who made that battery? You guessed it, Dalian Ranka Power. Now, while this facility is already the world's largest RFB, the final installation will create twice as much power. I couldn't find any confirmation that this facility is using the mixed electrolyte, but I did hear from sources that Dalian is currently manufacturing the new electrolyte in large quantities. But the craziness of this story doesn't stop there. Remember how the license was transferred to Vanitas Power? Well, as mentioned on their website, the company is contributing to the Dalian Ranka Power China-based project. Nonetheless, EU regulations will force Vanadis to set up a factory in Europe. You would think that the US government should be as reluctant as Europe when it comes to moving a US-funded invention overseas, right? Nevertheless, Uni Energy Technologies magically got away with that twice. I can hear you already. How on earth did this happen? As revealed by an NPR investigation, the Department of Energy failed to enforce its own licensing rules. When interviewing Department of Energy officials, the Government Accountability Office found that they were struggling to track their licenses because of limited budget and inadequate IT systems. What's even more absurd is that a Washington-based company like Forever Energy has been trying to get a license for this technology for over a year. And apparently the Department of Energy now has revoked the Dalian Ronk power license. And although it's too late to stop the Chinese battery expansion, perhaps the US government is still in time to prevent Forever Energy from changing its name to Forever Waiting. Now, awkwardly, the US funded the project with tax dollars, then sent it to China, and now a domestic manufacturer is blocked from making them. It's kind of crazy. Now, I actually had a chance to speak to Forever Energy about this whole debacle, as well as the technology they're trying to bring to market. They have a modular battery design that takes advantage of the mixed electrolyte's increased energy density. Single acid RFBs are usually pretty large and relegated to grid scale application, but Forever Energy has a working design that's roughly the size of a refrigerator and can store up to 40 kilowatt hours of energy. The best part is that it should be cost competitive with similarly sized lithium ion battery systems, but last 30 to 40 years. It's a solution meant to take on the residential energy storage market. Now, if they can secure the license, they're definitely a company to keep your eye on. There are some alternatives to Uni Energy's electrolyte recipe. For instance, US Vanadium claims to make the most pure electrolyte in the world. As heralded by the company, their formulation's ultra high purity increases the efficiency of Vanadium RFB. Having bought 580,000 liters of it, the energy storage provider CellCube seems to back their battery elixir. Galvanized by this deal, US Vanadium invested $2.1 million to expand their Arkansas-based electrolyte production. And CellCube will use US Vanadium's solution to fuel an 8 megawatt hour system in Illinois. The system will support a microgrid system and integrate with rooftop solar panels and a flywheel. And while this is a much lower scale application compared to the one developed by Ronk Power, it relies on 100% US supply chain. But there are some bigger projects underway as well. The California nonprofit energy supplier Central Coast Community Energy is planning to have up and running vanadium RFB installations for a total capacity of 226 megawatt hours by 2026. Being able to back up the grid for up to eight hours, these storage systems will be crucial to mitigate the effect of climate-induced blackouts that will occur in the state over the next few years. Now, whether being produced in the US, China, or elsewhere, redox flow batteries could help us make the most out of our renewables capabilities by providing viable energy storage during times of overgeneration. And having said that, while vanadium is relatively abundant, its conversion into vanadium pentoxide, the typical raw material for RFB, is highly localized, with Chinese and Russian mills accounting for about 75% of global production. 
So you can see why diversifying the supply chain is fundamental to catalyze the mass adoption of vanadium RFB. However, on that note, there are many ways to acquire vanadium, including from fly ash. The company US Vanadium in Hot Springs, Arkansas produces high quality vanadium using that method. The recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act here in the US is also gonna have a major impact on scaling up more local production. But how do RFB compare against the status quo lithium ion batteries? Well, first of all, unlike typical lithium containing electrolytes, vanadium based solutions aren't flammable. This means you won't have any risk of thermal runaway in case of faults or mishandling. Besides a greater flammability safety, RFB are also better for the environment. A recent life cycle assessment compared the eco impacts of vanadium RFB and lithium ion batteries. And even when using 100% virgin vanadium, RFB were found to be greener than lithium ion storage devices in terms of land acidification, particulate matter release, and human toxicity. And what's more is that replacing 50% of the feedstock with recycled vanadium would further reduce its global warming contribution. And that's feasible in the real world. Remember US vanadium? Well, last year the company recovered 97% of their spent electrolyte in a demonstration project. However, on the lithium ion battery side of things, there are many startups that have been improving lithium recovery and their costs. Another key advantage of RFB is a more flexible design than self-contained systems like lithium ion battery cells. When it comes to RFB, energy and power output are decoupled or independent if you like. Increasing the storage capacity is just down to expanding the external tanks holding the electrolyte. There's no need to add more cells to the stack or add to the stack itself. For long duration applications, when you need to deliver many kilowatt hours, switching to RFB will save power waste and costs, which can dispatch electricity for 12 hours or more. In theory, they could go even higher, but in practice, you need to factor in costs. Same applies to lithium ion batteries, whose most economical storage duration is capped at around six to eight hours right now. In addition, thanks to its lower degradation, RFB have a lifespan up to 30 years, in some cases, even longer. In comparison, typical lithium ion devices can last about 10 years or so, depending on their use. And once again, other designs such as lithium titanate based cells could run for much longer, but they're not as financially viable. On the other hand, RFB's round trip efficiency is around 85% if you're lucky, while lithium ion sits around 95%. Now one practical safety issue is the long-term storage of acidic solutions. While RFBs are less flammable, their use of a hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid means these corrosive and toxic chemicals must be stored on site, perhaps outside your house. Not just a little bit either, we're talking about many liters of it depending on how much energy you need to store. And when the system is damaged or eventually corrodes, the leak could be hazardous. Now with proper engineering and maintenance, this shouldn't be a major concern, but it's still important to keep in mind. So what about costs? A recent simulation compared the economics of lithium ion and vanadium redox flow batteries when integrated with a 636 kilowatt PV facility in Southern California. Researchers found that the system can achieve a levelized cost of electricity or LCOE below 22 cents per kilowatt hour using either of the storage technologies. However, they did mention that vanadium redox flow batteries would make more sense in hotter climates where lithium ion devices age faster. And when it comes to levelized cost of storage, duration is a key factor. Specifically at discharging times lower than four hours, lithium ion batteries work out cheaper. Conversely, the longer the duration, vanadium redox flow batteries become more cost effective. Now, on the other hand, when considering transmission systems as a use case, redox flow batteries are more expensive than lithium ion, pumped hydro, and compressed air storage technologies. Now, just to give you some perspective, the vanadium based system is the lowest cost option among RFB with an LCOS as low as $314 per megawatt hour. In contrast, relying on compressed air, you would store energy for as little as $116 per megawatt hour. With more investments and efficiency improvements, in 2030, RFB will be one of the most competitive storage solutions for discharge times above four hours and requiring more than 300 cycles per year. For instance, a 1% round trip efficiency increase would make RFB displace lithium ion for high frequency applications. Now clearly giving away our electrolyte recipe to China was a terrible mistake and we're gonna to continue to pay for it. And an American company who's actually trying to bring this technology to market is still struggling to get that license to do so but there's still time for redemption. We already have the expertise. So catching up is just down to building out a solid supply chain. Being more sustainable, scalable, and durable than lithium ion devices, the US should bet on this technology without losing its returns this time. Now, if this long-term energy storage tech pans out, we'll keep our grid flowing even when climate-driven disruptions hit. So are you still undecided? Do you think the US can catch up and that flow batteries can make a difference? Jump in the comments and let me know. And be sure to check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll be discussing some of your feedback. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones over here. And thanks to all my patrons for your continued support and a big welcome to new producers, AG Balu and Chris Bash. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.